Good afternoon. I'm Michael Stryker, a professor in the physiology department and the neuroscience program. And I must say I'm tremendously grateful to Bruce for the, the honor of being asked to organize this last session on critical unsolved problems in neuroscience. This is perhaps the farthest afield of what we've heard about today in the incredibly broad spectrum of, of Mike's interests. Now, others have discussed how, as, as chancellor, Mike Bishop built this campus where we gather today. And I'm sure, actually, for a lot of people in the audience, uh, for those who work here every day, the feeling of awe has passed. But awe and, and pride in the accomplishments to which Mike led UCSF are really in, in full force for the people who work on Parnassus when they visit here, people for whom the memory of groundbreaking for Genentech Hall a decade ago conjures up a vision of just dirt in all directions. <laughs> but I wanted to start by speaking of another accomplishment of Mike's, something he built before he held any formal leadership post. And this is his fostering of an all-inclusive culture of science at UCSF and the creation in the mid-1980s of PIBS, the program in biological sciences named for its generous supporters, originally the Markey Foundation and later Herb Boyer. At its creation, PIBS was unique in transcending the boundaries between traditional academic departments to create a community of science that was focused around an ideal vision for graduate education and modern biology as the center of our whole biological enterprise. And PIBS was also unique among the leading centers for graduate education and biology at least, and in including from the outset neuroscience as one of the facets of modern biology, a development that was really crucial to the success of UCSF in this field. Institutionally, PIBS was disruptive in many ways. Indeed, the, the graduate division took no formal notice of it at all for, for many years. But by ceding ultimate control of faculty and graduate admissions to interdepartmental PhD programs, with the final say residing with PIBS, the scientific leadership at UCSF was able to make the recruitments of young scientists into all the departments of our campus, basic as well as clinical, much more attractive than it had been, resulting in a faculty really of stellar scientific quality throughout the institution. And of course, it also had the intended improved effect on graduate education. Most important, PIBS brought all of us through retreats, courses, weekly student faculty journal clubs to a shared excitement about the, with the progress and with the insights of modern biology. And even students of neuroscience or students of diabetes heard in their dreams phrases like the awesome power of yeast genetics <laughs> promulgated and, and fostered through PIBS. The resulting culture of science and the shared excitement really not only thrilled us all and promoted new directions in our research, but made it possible to do many new things. And these attitudes, it's, it's funny to talk about it now with the young people, because these attitudes now are completely commonplace, indeed nearly universal, but at the time they were unprecedented. And Mike was really our leader in guiding us toward them and inspiring all of us to work to put them into effect. And now, of course, our, it's not clear what our advantage is because all our colleague or competitor institutions have the same sorts of arrangements. But we really were there first through Mike's leadership. I mean, in, in retrospect, as I thought about it, it's amazing that Mike, with his vision, his joy in the intellectual life of science, and his gift for inspiring colleagues to idealistic rather than selfish behavior, mainly through example, and a modest amount of money provided by the Markey Foundation, an amount comparable to about one year of state funding for the basic science departments, 
Mike was able really to lead us to, ar to arrangements and in an institutional culture that brought out the best in UCSF and let us recruit new young faculty who were the most exciting in the country. And I think we should honor him for this as much as for this building this beautiful new campus. The culture that he led us to create really is, is the competitive advantage of UCSF. And I think it's what makes us all grateful to be here. So, <laughs> thank you, Mike. So Bruce asked us to talk about critical unsolved problems in biology. And I think for this audience particularly, it's uh, useful to start by saying, well, what are the problems that have been more or less solved in neuroscience? And neuroscience really has progressed tremendously in the last 30 years. And some of this progress has come from UCSF. So building on a classic knowledge of vision, audition, and touch, we now know a lot about the molecular identity and the properties of the receptors and peripheral pathways for most kinds of sensation, including here at UCSF, pain and temperature sensation and work done by David Julius and Alan Basbaum and John Levine and Howard Fields, along with work elsewhere on olfaction and taste. Equally important, we know a lot about how to compensate for defects in or injuries to some of these receptors. For example, with Mike Merzenich's breakthrough work on the biology that made possible the cochlear implant, a medical device that's changed the lives of many, many deaf people. More centrally in the brain, we know a lot about how at least some excitatory synapses, connections between neurons, become stronger or weaker as a result of patterns of neural activity, a phenomenon that has to be one of the substrates of learning through the work of Roger Nickel and others. And we know the outline, if not all the cellular details of how some sorts of reflexes get tuned to perfection. Steve Lisberger's work, for example, on the, vestibu the vestibulo-ocular reflex that keeps our vision clear, even as we move our heads around while we walk or talk, has led the way in this endeavor. And even phenomena that are difficult to study in animals, including aspects of language like the preservation and consolidation of the neural detectors for the phonemes that are actually used in our own language, have a clear explanation, at least an outline. So while few problems in neuroscience are completely solved in all of their molecular, cellular, neural circuit, and information processing detail, there really are straightforward research directions that for many of these problems at least seem likely to lead to the solutions. So what then are the critical unsolved problems? I would maintain that we have little clue about how the brain carries out some of the things that make us most human. Not just the obvious one, language, but a whole raft of other functions. We have no clear idea, for example, of how we learn complex concepts how we use logical inference to draw conclusions about novel events, how we find our way around in the new environment, physical, social, and political, that surrounds us every day, and how any one of us in this room is able to give a running account of the unique history of our lives and the events surrounding us from the time we got up this morning until the beginning of this lecture. One difference between the things we basically understand and the ones we, that are still really a, a mystery to experimental neuroscience is repetition. The brain plasticity that we understand generally involves repetition and the gradual accumulation of changes in particular populations of synapses that ultimately result in incremental changes in brain wiring. The plasticity that we do not understand typically involves unique events. So our critical unsolved problem in neuroscience is how the brain represents the unique events of everyday life and lets us function logically in a sea of change in a world that's both social, intellectual, uh, and conceptual. Our distinguished visitor is a philosopher. And as far as I know, this is a first for UCSF in a scientific symposium. It's actually my favorite philosopher, Patricia Churchland of the UCSD philosophy department and the Salk, and the Salk Institute. Pat has, more than any other modern thinker, 
clarify this disputed border region between philosophy and neuroscience. But, you know, she hasn't worked in the imperial manner of most philosophers who sort of claim the whole intellectual territory and then retreat with ill grace as we biologists make inroads into what they had hoped to preserve <laughs> as the exclusive domain of philosophy, using, of course, their superior verbal facility and, and cleverness. <laughs> Indeed, Pat, through her writings in neuroscience, uh, when she did, began to do this work and address issues of mind in an, in an approach that admitted the possibility that empirical things could be learned, she was really treated as, by the philosophical community as one who had gone over to the dark side <laughs> To, to court the influence and power of science in the modern world, a traitor to the philosophical community, as she wrote about the connections between philosophy and neuroscience. Neither, however, for us is Pat a biology groupie. She understands how we biologists reason and what are the kinds of evidence for the conclusions we draw about the brain, as well as an awesome amount of the detail she celebrates and advertises the genuine accomplishments of neuroscience, but she presses us unremittingly about the important issues that we do not understand. Her lecture today will focus on new ideas about how the brain represents the outside world in all its rich richness. And I should note that in addition to her many other virtues, Pat is the mother of not one, but two former UCSF graduate students. So our UCSF panelists, whom I won't get up to introduce again, include two of the bright young stars of systems neuroscience among our faculty. Michael Brainerd studies how the songbird's brain produces and communicates with song. Birdsong is perhaps the closest parallel to human language that one can study readily in an experimental animal. And aspects of Michael's work have concerned repetition-based learning but others fit more closely into the complexity of the bird's ever-changing social world. Lauren Frank studies how rats are able to find their way about in a new environment after only a minute or a few minutes of experience. He makes recordings in the hippocampus and related structures where single neurons rapidly become specific for particular places in any new world into which you put the rat. His system may be the closest animal model for the representation and memory of unique events. So, Pat? Thank you very much. First of all, thank you, uh, Mike Straker, for such a, a wonderful and warm introduction. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be here and, and actually to have a chance to talk to many of you again. I, I don't get up to UC San Francisco as much as I used to when uh, there were uh, certain other folks here <laughs> who were studying. But Mike and I have shared many hours of brainstorming on, on great big questions and on small questions. And uh, it's, it's very nice because Mike is one of the really hard-headed neuroscientists, and uh, if I'm stuck on something, I can come and ask him, and uh, he generally knows uh, what the bottom line is. So <clears throat> today, um, I'm going to say a little bit about how the brain represents um, the world, but mostly I'm going to talk about the social world. So um, I'm not sure how many here are neuroscientists, so some of the things that I say will almost certainly be very obvious and boring to you, um, uh, but perhaps others uh, will have a degree of novelty. To a first approximation, the brain is really interested in moving, moving the body. It's interested in behavior. And the other things that it does, it does fundamentally because it needs to make good predictions to inform the behavior so that things work out successfully for it. At some point in the evolution of nervous systems, it turned out to be very useful for brains to have an inner model of the outside world, roughly of its spatial organization, of the various temporal factors governing interactions, but particularly of causal relationships, 
of what tastes good and where to find it, of what hurts and how to avoid it. And if you're in the prey catching business, how to go about that. And of course, with humans in the physical world, we also causally interact with all kinds of other things that turns out to be greatly to our advantage. Almost certainly, um, there, were, there was extensive uh, use of causal knowledge by earlier hominins, including the use of fire, uh, both by Neanderthals, but also by hominins that predated modern humans. So there is some way that the brain creates a sort of coherent, integrated model of the outside world. And although we do understand bits and pieces of what goes into that model, the function of coherencing and integration is understood almost not at all. And we sort of wave our hands towards the idea of coherencing and integration, but we don't know in neural terms what that really means. There is, of course, the social world, here represented by a pair of baboons. And the social world, especially in highly social mammals, is very complex. And so a baboon, for example, uh, must know a great deal about the social organization of its troop. Males leave the troop early and females uh, remain within the troop. There are matrilineal rankings and each matriline involves the head lady and then her daughter and then various others. So a group may contain five matrilines and everybody in the troop knows who belongs where within the matrilines as well as across matrilines. They also know a huge amount about how exactly you should behave if you're lower ranked relative to somebody else. So there's a huge amount of social knowledge so that there is a kind of inner model of the social world. And sometimes this is characterized by saying that, that animals and humans have a theory of mind. We don't really know what that comes to either or what that means in terms of a complex social mammal uh, like a baboon. And finally, of course, there are inner models of the self. Uh, almost certainly all animals have at least a rudimentary conception represented with, within brain circuitry of the body. But some are also capable of doing what this chimpanzee is doing, and that is recognizing itself in the mirror and being able to manipulate certain body parts within the mirror. There are many animals who are quite capable, and this includes birds, especially corvids, of knowing how their body can be seen by another. And so there is some sense of understanding the perspective of another. But again, what that exactly means in neural terms uh, is not well understood. Mostly what I'm going to talk about uh, is the social world, and I want to say a little bit about what I have been working on recently, which is a book called Brain-Based Values, which has just been sent off to the publisher. And it addresses the question from a neurobiological point of view of what the platform for morality uh, might actually look like. Prior to doing that, I just want to say a little bit by way of reminder as we theorize about how the brain can build inner models of self, others, and the causal world. First of all, of course, there are energy constraints. The brain is about 3% of the mass of the body, and it uses about 20% of the energy. So it's very energy intensive, and if you're Mother Nature, you can't just be building uh, wiring hither and yon because your energy costs are going to rise. There are also wiring constraints, by which I mean, to a first approximation, that the head can only be so big. If you're a mammal, you're going to have to get yourself born, and uh, you can't have large, really huge amounts of wiring. So there are wiring constraints. There are also, of course, evolutionary constraints, and this came up um, in, the, in the very first talk in a really kind of lovely way, I think. And that is that Mother Nature doesn't build from scratch, of course, and so whatever tinkering takes place, takes place in the context of what's already there. And it looks like one of the more, 
more recent discoveries, depending on new technology, that's really important, is to understand in a general way the nature of the connectivity in the brain. Now, it's not that nothing has been known in the past, but in the past we have depended quite largely on uh, doing histology in post-mortem brains. And that's often extremely time-consuming and, and doesn't give you the information, uh, as much information as you would like. The development of, of uh, diffusion imaging has allowed us to at least at the level of the cubic millimeter to say something about long-range connectivity. And this is just one picture taken from a recent paper by Bullmore and Sporns, who are, along with other people, uh, using this technique to chart uh, connectivity in the brain. And one of the things that you'll see here is that the blue is, uh, is roughly speaking, uh, involved in sensory uh, integration, whereas the red connection is uh, the more prefrontal structure. The, roughly, I, I know I keep saying roughly, but that's because this is going to be a very broad talk and not a very deep talk. Um, small world connectivity seems to be the pattern of organization across nervous systems in general, by which is meant that there is a high connectivity in very local regions and then sparse connectivity to long range regions, but where any individual, though not closely connected to his neighbor, can via the long, long range connections uh, get to the neighbor fairly quickly. I think this will turn out to be extremely important as the structure functional relationships uh, are developed and we understand in a greater, uh, to a greater extent how the brain is actually organized. That of course pertains to cortex. This is just to remind us that a huge amount of the brain's business is actually done subcortically. This is a slide prepared by Joe Parvizzi who's really interested in subcortical structures and so as you can see he made the cortical structures quite small. Another background point. Uh, this is an old slide. Uh, many of you will have seen it before. But it is still useful, I think, in making the point that in nervous systems, as in any aspect of the body, there are many levels of organization. We're not sure exactly what levels of organization there are and what levels are the most appropriate in terms of getting highly successful and predictive uh, characterizations. But it looks at least as though there are these. They are just put uh, according to spatial scale, which is, of course, a very crude way to do it. The philosophical point might be that uh, we need to have research at all of these levels simultaneously by different labs. But if that's to work, then you need to do the thing of integrating across labs so that, for example, what people are doing with single neurons can inform and constrain what people are doing with networks and vice versa. <coughs> so it's not that one expects there to be uh, an explanation of a complex phenomenon such as smooth pursuit in, in eye movements in terms of the level of molecules but most likely, although this could be wrong, it will be a sort of stepwise uh, kind of series of explanations. Now, the other point that I want to make, uh, again, this is a sort of a reminder for many of you from Psych 101, but the brain is not a passive input-output device. Rodolfo Linus is fond of saying the brain is not an input-output device at all partly because there's so much spontaneous activity that's going on independently of anything that comes in, but also because the brain is constantly constructing. So in this particular slide, there are a series of blue lines. As you can see, take any blue line and stick a black bar on either end. Once you do that, you get this, except that now it looks quite different. Whereas here, there seems to be no connectivity, no little blue veil across. 
here there is. There is a kind of, as it were, filling in of color uh, between those black lines. Um, this one is, is a reminder of a similar thing, which again is that you can have precisely the same per, uh, sensory input but very different perceptions. And that's the brain going about its constructive business. And moreover, you can't see different interpretations simultaneously, or at least normal people can't, so if you can. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, and uh, these sorts of things are, of course, uh, fun to play with, but they also make a very deep point about interpretation in perception, and that, uh, that the brain is always involved in interpreting, or as Helmholtz actually thought of it, as making an inference about what's out there. But what it really is, is some way of the neurons interacting to create an interpretation of what it thinks is there. And the Gestalt psychologists, who were vilified for many years during the heyday of behaviorism, also understood quite well that there is something fundamental about the way the sensory systems will organize uh, certain kinds of, uh, of data. These ones happen to be visual, but of course we know that the same is true in uh, the auditory system. Another background point. <laughs> and I think this might be useful in this context, partly because um, many of you, I think, are involved in, in research at the cellular level. And when you think about neurons, it's also important to remember that actually psychologists have taught us quite a few things that uh, turn out to be important. One is, and this is easy to forget, um, and I think I know why, but and I'll tell you. Um, one is that our everyday concepts and categories, the ones that get us around the world and off and on the trains and in and out of the grocery store and all of that, have a radial structure, by and large, with prototypical examples at the center, similarity relations going out, and fuzzy boundaries at the edge. Scientific concepts, which we try to make very precise in terms of necessary and sufficient conditions, are a highly unusual instance of categories in general. What we actually do in science is take a category that has a radial structure and try to reconfigure it in the light of our understanding to make it more precise. So in this particular instance, the category is vegetable. It turns out that if you ask undergraduates what's the first vegetable that comes to your mind, they mostly all say carrot. I mean, there's other ways of testing this too. Uh, <laughs> Uh, radishes are, are not prototypical vegetables. They're sort of not right at the periphery, but some people don't consider them vegetables, but merely garnishes, whereas mushrooms are really at the border. Um, mostly, I mean, and this is, I think, a really interesting fact about the structure of our categorical maps that we put on the world to organize our experience. Most things have that kind of organization. Moreover, it turns out that artificial neural nets are very capable of learning these kinds of categories and are very capable of making uh, approximate uh, uh, decisions. Now, I have a particular reason for wanting to talk about these categories, and it has to do with morality, which I'll get to in a moment. But it is also important to recognize that even for common categories, there are cultural differences. So that we might pick this out as the prototypical house, but there are other people for whom that's the prototypical house. For many years, my mother-in-law thought that was a prototypical house because she was born in one. And there are other people for whom, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, let me come back to that. Social categories. Now, this is the part of the talk where I begin to say something about morality. 
social categories like vegetable and mountain and river and student and so forth are also radial. You, people learn them by being exposed to prototypical examples. There are similarity measures, uh, similarity relationships, and fuzzy boundaries. That's how we learn what it is to, for someone to be a friend or to be honest or not, to be kind or not, uh, and so forth. And I think this is also true with respect to right and wrong. So part of the story that I will now tell is a story about values. And it's a story that puts rules as a much later development, as not part of what I think of as the fundamental platform. Darwin, of course, was very puzzled by and very interested in the phenomenon of cooperation and of sociality in general amongst animals, and in particular amongst mammals, but also, of course, and very famously, amongst birds. He thought that our moral sense or our conscience had three particular parts. The social instincts, habits, the development of understanding of what the local practices are, and reason. And what I think is interesting is that from a neurobiological point of view, we are now able to say a lot about those two and even a little about that. The hypothesis that I'm going to present then today is that sociability is a basic value for certain mammals, for many mammals, and that it was selected for in the natural course of events. That the hub of sociality, but only the hub, is the peptide oxytocin. There are, of course, many other parts to the story, including vasopressin and serotonin and dopamine and so forth. That sociality is augmented by the reward system. The reward system is engaged as the animal learns the social practices and as the animal is punished, but usually by shunning and ostracizing, but also by biting and kicking. Um, well, and whacking and what have you, um, uh, for uh, misbehavior. And um, that this is elaborated with the expansion of the prefrontal structures. So there is a fairly similar story to be told between rodents and large-brained mammals, uh, but of course there are going to be substantial differences. Now, the second part of the hypothesis then depends on the idea that attachment and trust are the fundamental platform for moral values, for all those things that we think of as moral values in the human, but also in the baboon and the chimpanzee and the marmoset community. They are actually the dispositions. It's the way that the circuitry is organized that contours the social problem space so that certain social um, solutions to a problem for example, of conflict resolution or of distribution of resources, certain solutions are better than others. And they constitute the motivation to find good solutions to practical problems. So the question has long been, of course, how do you get from just me to others? And that's what I'm going to address fairly briefly now. In a way, of course, it's puzzling how it could be that neurons value anything. I mean, how can it be that just a bunch of neurons passing ions back and forth across their membranes can care about anything? And the answer, of course, is that the circuitry is organized in such a way that you feel pain under certain conditions and you feel pleasure in other conditions. And the pain and the pleasure they can, there can be different pains and different pleasures, and they can be hitched to circuitry that involves very specific kinds of behavior, approach behavior or avoidance behavior, being, fleeing or fighting or what have you. This constitutes the basic level of value of any kind. It is the root of value. 
this is going to be awfully fast, and so I really do apologize, because there is lots to be said here. But of course, you can buy the book. Um, <laughs> With mammals, now sociality has almost certainly evolved many times, and uh, Richard and I were talking about this this morning. But in mammals, and I won't say much about birds unless asked, uh, in mammals, we see a reorganization of the hypothalamus and other brain, uh, limbic structures so that there is not just caring about me, but caring about me and mine. And uh, so there is the ex this constitutes the expansion of the domain beyond just me. I think what, uh, for me, constituted a kind of epiphany was the realization that mate attachment in prairie voles, as contrasted to no mate attachment in montane voles, could be explained really quite simply. And what you're looking at are, of course, coronal sections. These are male voles. These are montane voles who do not show mate preference. These are prairie vole, male prairie voles who do. Um, this story will be familiar to many of you, but in case not, the male prairie voles um, mate for life after the first, or uh, are attached for life after the first mating. The male takes uh, part in the rearing of the pups. And he is also quite aggressive in guarding the female and guarding the nest. And the question that, that Sue Carter and her colleagues asked was, what's the difference in the brain? And it turned out that the difference in the brain has to do with the density of receptors for oxytocin in the nucleus accumbens and the density of receptors for vasopressin in the ventral pallidum. So that's a very interesting result from the question, from the point of view of those of us who want to understand how you extend caring from me and offspring to others. Because it looks like the major genetic modification goes with mammals, that is getting from just me, where I lay my eggs and carry on, to me and devoting huge amounts of time and energy and effort to caring for the offspring. Now, the caring of the offspring is interesting because it involves both pain, when there is separation from the offspring, or when there are distress calls. So you're motivated to stop the pain. And there's also pleasure during lactation and when there is reconnection. And so, uh, I mean, one way to think about it, of course, is that your brain is organized to do this so that being with those that you love feels good. Being separated uh, feels bad. And the same turns out to be true of the prairie voles. Now, in highly social mammals, and th there aren't all that many that are very highly social, it looks like you get an extension beyond me and my kin to kith, which broadly speaking means those within my community, my familiars, my associates, my friends. And it may be that a relatively small genetic change uh, can account for the shift from me to kin to kith. Oxytocin, I mentioned, is, at, is really at the hub of these major changes in the limbic system that we see in mammals. It has, of course, been now extensively investigated, both in humans and in rodents. There's quite a lot that's known, but there's a massive amount that is not known. It is known that it decreases defensive postures, that it downregulates responses in the amygdala, that it downregulates arousal responses in the brain stem, and that, in general, it acts uh, as a kind of safety signal. So to recap this, then, the social urges involve uh, pleasure and pain caused by social interactions. There is pleasure involved in giving food to the offspring or to the mate. And uh, there is pleasure in such things as grooming and being groomed. But of course, the other part of the story is that there is also aggression involved. Uh, aggression in care of mate or aggression in care of friends 
and certainly of offspring. And that brings us, of course, to the, as it were, the dark side of morality, which is a part of what we are. So I don't want you to think that if we talk about sociality and humans, it's all about goodness and kindness and cooperation and altruism. That's part of the story, uh, but certainly outgroup hostility, which is, as we know from the experiments that Phil Zimbardo did at Stanford, uh, extremely easy to generate. It's also important at this time that I should mention that I'm only talking about the neurobiological platform for morality, and that, of course, culture plays a really important role or at least has done maybe for the last 12,000 years. Uh, it may very well be the case, since we think humans have been on the planet for about 300,000 years, that for most of that time, our social life was not very different from that of baboons. Because after all, we don't see any evidence for tool making until about 75,000 years ago. And we don't see any evidence for cave painting and so forth until about 45,000 years ago. So probably for most of our life on the planet, uh, we didn't have particularly fancy language or particularly fancy moral conceptions. Um, now, social problem solving in complex mammals is obviously going to be very important, where the uh, enlarged prefrontal cortex is going to be important as the animal envisages a plan and its consequences, weighs and evaluates, and that's a skill. And then some dogs are better than other dogs at it, some humans are better than other humans at it. And another part of sociality, and this is certainly true of all primates, is the capacity to remember who did what to whom, reputation. And that's something, of course, about which uh, Lauren will say. Now, I've just got uh, sort of one and a half more slides. So uh, we have part of the story, at least, on Darwin's idea of what the social instincts are. And part of the idea of habit forming. And the third part was reasoning, or what I prefer to call problem solving. And basically, from the point of view both of psychology and neuroscience, nobody has the slightest idea what reasoning really consists in. A little bit of it every now and again might be a bit of deduction, like the kind you spent a whole year learning in baby logic. Mostly that's not what's going on. Mostly it's making, as you might say, a kind of leap to a hypothesis and then seeing how it works out. But we really don't know what it is, except that, again, in a very hand-waving way, we might say, it looks like a constraint satisfaction problem, where there are many different constraints, and the brain lands in a good minimum. And when it's a good minimum, we say that the person was rational. And when it was a paradigmatically or prototypically bad minimum, we say that the person was irrational. It's a lot not to know, um, and the great hope of philosophy in the 20th century was that logic, as typified by that formal stuff, that symbol manip manipulation stuff that you learned, would map onto reasoning. And it just does not. And I'm just going to end then uh, with this slide, uh, A, because it's cheerful, but also <laughs> because we all think of orangs as not highly social. And the animal studies people are so wonderful because they keep coming up, the field people particularly, come up with, with data that's really very surprising. Oh, this is obviously not a field study. Um, <laughs> but what, one of the things that they're finding is that sociality in mammals depends a lot on resource availability. And so it may be that orangs are quite happy to be social as long as 
the food resources are there and they're not competing with others uh, within a territory. But that, that, of course, is fairly chummy. And we see a certain kind of crossing of species lines all over the place as soon as people start looking for them. Not on a grand scale, but on a small enough scale to make you realize that this caring for others and liking to belong and not wanting to be shunned and liking to be uh, groomed and so forth is something that doesn't have really tight boundaries. Unless, of course, conditions are very harsh and very severe where you can only participate uh, with, uh, with your own particular offsprings. OK, um, so with that, um, I'm going to close. And I'll hand it over to Michael Brainer, who's going to talk about birds. OK, well, I'm uh, uh, Michael Brainerd in the physiology department here. And I'm going to just spend a few minutes following up on one of the themes that uh, Pat touched on in her talk. And that is that although we are uh, still far from having a very complete and satisfactory account at a mechanistic level about how various aspects of human cognition arise, it may still be um, useful, or especially useful, to focus on simpler model systems where there's an opportunity to study a behavior in a very controlled setting and to use the tools of neuroscience to investigate at a mechanistic level by recording activity in the brain and manipulating the activity how, uh, how behaviors are being executed. And my mandate from Michael was uh, essentially to take, uh, take you through a few illustrations of how these tools of systems neuroscience can be used in such an investigation, and I'll do that focusing on uh, songbirds, which are the model system that are studied in my lab. Now, uh, song learning and songbirds have been interest to neuroscientists for quite a few decades based on the observation that song uh, is culturally transmitted in a manner that uh, bears a striking resemblance to certain aspects of uh, human language transmission. Uh, this was first observed or really carefully documented by Peter Marler who showed that if you collected eggs, say, in Sunset Beach where sparrows happen to sing a song that could be represented like this, this is a spectrogram of song of the sort you might see in a bird book, uh, you let those uh, offspring hatch, but you expose them in a controlled fashion to the uh, mellower songs of the marine sparrow. What you find is that the young birds, when they grow up, sing a song which matches the tutor that they heard and not uh, their genetic parents. So this is sort of one of the first pieces of evidence that said song is a learned behavior and that it is transmitted from a parent to offspring uh, based on uh, exposure and experience. Now, th these sorts of observations, starting in the field and continuing in the laboratory, uh, led to what I'll call an algorithmic or block diagram model of how vocal learning proceeds, and that's illustrated here. Uh, this is uh, uh, schematizing the processes that contribute to learning in songbirds, but they're very parallel to the processes that we think contribute to speech acquisition in humans. Namely, there's a early on a process in which we and birds listen to others, and we form perceptual memories or internal representations of the sounds of others. And this forms an acoustic goal to which we try to match our own developing vocalizations. Now, in the case of songbirds, this matching process proceeds by uh, motor structures in the brain, song uh, premotor structures. These are equivalent to vocal motor cortex in humans. These structures generate uh, behavior, in this case, song. The initial song that's produced in these birds and in birds at large is highly variable. It's uh, generic across individuals. It doesn't yet show any evidence of the particular tutors or adult models to which the birds have been exposed. But what happens is birds uh, listen to themselves. They use hearing uh, auditory feedback to monitor their own initial attempts, their own vocalizations. In some fashion, they compare the feedback that they produce with this internal representation or acoustic goal and generate signals, instructive signals, which modify the motor circuitry so that over time, the bird, uh, the bird song progressively comes to more closely match that acoustic goal, the sound usually of the father in these species. So. Um, this is a process of feedback-dependent learning, and as I mentioned, it's uh, very analogous to the kind of uh, process that we go through in speech acquisition where we uh, form a representation of the sounds of the native languages to which we're exposed, and we also rely critically on auditory feedback to gradually refine our initial uh, babbling vocalizations so that they uh, uh, eventually become matched to our, our appropriate language models. So uh, what, what I want to do in the next, next few minutes is, is take, uh, take you through a few very brief vignettes illustrating how we can take what is a relatively abstract description here of a complex behavior that has some parallels to human, uh, human behaviors and uh, begin to dissect it both in terms of the rules that 
govern the behavior as well as the machinery in the brain that carries it out. So I'll tell you three uh, very brief stories that relate to an elaboration of this kind of model. The first of these is uh, an example of using a careful study of the behavior to understand the rules of learning. In this case, we're focusing on the role of auditory feedback in adult animals. Uh, for humans, it's been known that um, auditory feedback continues to play a role in the maintenance of normal uh, uh, speech patterns in adulthood. And uh, for songbirds, it was long thought that uh, the stability of adult song did not reflect kind of a ongoing continuing monitoring, but rather a stabilization of motor structures so that they no longer relied on experience. Uh, to test this idea and to ask whether feedback was important in adult animals, what we did was to equip birds with little miniaturized uh, headphones here. We could then uh, record their vocalizations, pass them through, uh, in this case, pitch shifting hardware. So what the bird experienced at his ears through little speakers embedded here was the sound of his own voice, but with errors that were under our control. So we could artificially make the bird sound too high in pitch to himself or too low and ask whether and how the bird compensated for those perturbations. And what we found is shown here. Uh, in this case, at day one of this experiment, the bird experienced an upward shift of feedback, and we find over a period of days, the bird gradually and consistently lowers the, the, the pitch at which he produces his song so as to compensate for this introduced error. And conversely, if we uh, introduce a downward shift of pitch on day zero, the bird shifts his production upwards again so as to restore normal feedback of the ears. So these sorts of experiments and manipulations of behavior, which are possible in animal models, allow us to uh, ask what, what precisely are the rules that govern uh, the behavior and govern learning. In this case, show that adult song uh, in birds, as is the case for adult speech in humans, relies on a continual monitoring of self-generated feedback relative to some stable internal goal or acoustic target in this case. So, so given this kind of uh, description, we then want to go into the brain and ask, how is it being carried out? What's the machinery in the brain that's responsible for the production of the behavior and ultimately for its modification in the context of learning? And for this, uh, the bread and butter tool of neurophysiology is to record and monitor neural activity in order to understand which parts of the brain convey signals that are relevant to the behavior, what do those signals look like, and to try to make inferences from those signals about how the behavior is being executed or controlled by the nervous system. So uh, I'll show you here just an example of such recordings from motor structures that help us define where in the brain this behavior of vocal production and vocal learning uh, is controlled and uh, how it's altered during learning. We use for this process uh, chronic recordings. The bird's equipped with a little microdrive so that we can introduce very fine wire electrodes in the brain. They're nestled up against neurons in the bird's brain at targeted locations, and we can monitor the activity of individual neurons as the bird is behaving, and in this case, as the bird is producing his, his song. So here is an example. This is a movie in which you'll hear the song, in this case a Bengalese Finch song, uh, that's produced by an individual uh, and it'll be shown at the top. And at the bottom is the activity of one neuron in the bird's brain while the bird uh, produces this song. Uh, on the auto track you'll be able to hear uh, the individual action potentials, which are these vertical marks here, that as little clicking sounds which reflect the firing of the neuron as the bird is singing. If I can get it to work. And, uh, So we had this almost working. There we go. Okay, so um, what I hope you noticed there was that the neurons in this part of the brain were very uh, tonically active, regularly active when the bird was quiescent and not singing, but that prior to the onset of song, which starts about here, the neuron began to modulate its firing in a bursting pattern, which in some sense was uh, correlated with the, with the production of the individual acoustic elements or syllables of the bird's song. And these data uh, are consistent with our view that these are neurons which carry signals appropriate to control the individual uh, elements of the bird's song. We've further investigated their properties and found, for example, that neurons in this particular part of the vocal cortex of the bird uh, have the property such that when they fire more spikes or action potentials, there's a corresponding increase in the pitch of the associated portion of the bird's song. So these sorts of experiments allow us to identify our brain regions in the bird that are engaged in producing the behavior. These are the motor control neurons that contribute to the structure, the acoustic structure of the individual vocalizations, and it's presumably uh, these neurons which alter their activity in the context of learning in response to manipulations such as the perturbations of uh, feedback, which I showed you a little bit earlier. 
Now, to really gain an understanding of, of how this kind of uh, learning process is carried out, what we want to ultimately be able to do is not just identify the presence of signals, for example, that relate to perturbations of feedback, but to be able to causally demonstrate that their presence at particular locations in the brain contributes to modification of the behavior. And so lastly, I'll show you a little example of experiments in which we were trying to define, uh, in particular, the possibility that the uh, basal ganglia were central to this uh, process of evaluation during the refinement and maintenance of vocalizations. And the basal ganglia, as many of you know, are uh, widely conserved structures. They're found across uh, all vertebrates, and they uh, are, are structures that are thought to be involved in motor control, motor learning, uh, reward-based learning, and are structures that are implicated in a disease process such as, such, such as uh, Parkinson's and Huntington's diseases, construed largely as diseases of movement, as well as cognitive and psychiatric disorders such as uh, schizophrenia and uh, OCD. In the songbird, uh, these structures, the basal ganglia, receive convergent inputs from a wide variety of different sources that are relevant to controlling the behavior. They receive uh, auditory inputs as well as inputs from social signals, which we also know can contribute to shaping song. And they send a strong projection to motor structures of the brain. So they're well positioned to contribute to uh, this kind of learning process. And one of the ways we can test their role in addition to recording the presence of appropriate signals there is to manipulate activity in these structures uh, in context of learning and behavior. And so here uh, is a last data example of uh, an experiment in which we inactivated the basal ganglia of birds using a, a re reversible uh, anesthetization of the nuclei and asked what happened to the structure of song and to the ability of the bird to modify his song in response to experience. And here you can see, if you're an aficionado anyway, of spectrograms that inactivation has relatively little effect on the structure of the song that a normal uh, Bengali finch produces. These are three songs from an intact bird, three songs following uh, inactivation of the basal ganglia, but quite strikingly, while the intact bird can uh, learn uh, to modify his song in response to perturbations of feedback, can undergo normal pitch learning, this capacity is essentially uh, completely eliminated uh, when the basal ganglia are inactivated. So these uh, sorts of experiments in which we monitor and manipulate activity, we think have firmly placed the basal ganglia as part of the circuitry that participates in evaluation, in this case of auditory feedback, relative to an acoustic goal and that generates signals that are important uh, in contributing to modification of the behavior so as to approach that goal. And while uh, what I've shown you here is uh, specific to a process of learning in the songbird, I hope you can see that uh, this general sort of algorithm is one which equally well applies to a variety of different forms of vertebrate learning. Not only is it analogous particularly to uh, human speech acquisition where we use analogous sensory and motor modalities to refine our own vocalizations in response to um, uh, in experiential learning to match those vocalizations to perceptual targets, but more broadly, uh, all of the behaviors that we carry out, particularly those involving motor skills in which we evaluate the outcomes of our actions relative to internally stored goals uh, could equally well be uh, uh, represented by uh, such an algorithm. And so, so I, I want to conclude with an optimistic view that by studying how these processes are carried out in uh, simpler systems where we can uh, not only control the behavior but go into the brain and ask what are the specific neurons, where are they, uh, how do they convey signals and ultimately contribute to uh, both the behavior and its modification, we will gain insight not only into um, how uh, some of the uh, more complex uh, cognitive capacities of humans that are built out of similar machinery are carried out, but also uh, in so doing begin to understand how different components of brain circuitry such as the basal ganglia uh, contribute to uh, normal behavior and are uh, disrupted in the context of various pathologies. So I will, uh, I'll stop there and turn it over to Lauren Frank who's going to talk a little bit about how the brain uh, forms uh, rapidly internal representations that may contribute to establishing goals that guide behavior. <clears throat> All right, well, um, as the last speaker, I just wanted to thank all of you who have stood, uh, stayed with us for the entire time, um, and also just pass on thanks to Mike. I, uh, as a relatively new addition to the faculty, have benefited hugely from both the intellectual atmosphere here and in two years, hope to benefit very much from the Mission Bay campus. Um, those of us who are moving over here are really excited by the idea of taking some of the things that we've learned about how neural systems work and trying to understand the parallels and perhaps the lack of parallels to the cellular networks that so many people here are studying. So what I'm going to talk about is ideas about how we might create memories for events, right? So all of you here can at least 
discuss to some degree, whether you're here for just the last couple of talks or the whole day, what you've done today. And you did that despite the fact that you probably weren't concentrating hard on this, you weren't trying to remember everything, but yet there's this automatic record that takes, that is created in the brain. And we're trying to understand how is it possible that the brain can do that? How do we take in the moment by moment experiences that sort of, rel uh, that, um, that, consi that our lives consist of and store those and then use those later to guide experience. Um, and this is in a complementary learning system. Whoops, that was not what I was hoping for. Let's try that one. Um, to what Michael talked about, he talked about the basal ganglia system. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the hippocampal learning system. And sort of the overall model of how this works is as follows. <laughs> Information from the outside world, sensory inputs, as well as information about the current state of the organism is represented in the neocortex. This is much of the brain. This is an area which seems to be dominated by relatively slow plasticity. And what I mean by that is the neocortex alone doesn't seem to be capable of storing memories for the moment by moment events of our life. Instead, there's this area called the hippocampus, which is a site of extremely rapid plasticity, where the connections between neurons can change on literally a millisecond time scale, where new memories seem to be initially stored. This is a process that's often called encoding. Uh, for those of you who've seen the movie Memento, the person in that movie who had no ability to connect things from one moment to the next had hippocampal damage. And so we'd like to understand what's special about the hippocampus. How does it interact with the rest of the brain? How does it take this information and how does it use it? What we know of is that there's an initial process of encoding, but there's a subsequent feedback process where some of these memories that are stored initially in the hippocampus become distributed throughout wider networks. There's also a retrieval process whereby you can say, I can, for example, ask you, what did you have for breakfast? And all of you can mentally time travel back to breakfast and tell me what you had, again, even though you didn't explicitly and intentionally store that information. And this loop seems to be important. And also as the last speaker, I just wanted to comment that biology, as far as I can tell, is all about loops. Right? There are extremely few parts of biology of any form that don't involve feedback circuits. Right? And I think a huge part of our challenge is understanding how those feedback circuits work at all sorts of levels. And so what I'm going to tell you a little bit are about some sort of initial insights we've gained into how parts of this feedback circuit might work to store memories and then to retrieve them. And also just to mention in terms of what Pat, Pat talked about and what Michael mentioned, if you think about who we are as people, how we come to our moral decisions, much of what we think of as ourselves is based on the experiences that we've had as individuals. We have to store those experiences. We have to generalize across them to sort of extract the rules that we go that are govern our daily lives and the hippocampus is important for a large part of that process again storing those initial memories so what I'm going to show you here is a single hippocampal neuron that we've recorded from an animal exploring a new place for the first time so this top part represents the spatial activity um, so this is the spatial component of across a track which has two areas one here and one here the part you can focus your attention on is right over here. This is a new arm of a maze. It's basically a three-arm maze. The animal runs up into the new place, back, and here's a, this is a familiar place. You don't need to worry about the temporal component for the moment. That's just indicating sort of a, a reminder that neurons are complicated and that we have to take into account their moment-by-moment -moment structure as well. This will indicate time in seconds. You'll see it's going to go quite fast because we sped this up so that you can see it in a minute rather than the 15 minutes of data it represents. And this dot represents the rat and what it's doing as it enters this new place. And you'll see little hash marks here when this neuron is firing spikes. And you'll see our instantaneous estimate of what the neuron cares about as a bump in these curves. The dark green representing motion in this direction and the light green representing motion in that direction. All right. And with the hope that this works, what you'll see is as the animal starts running around, he'll enter this new place, and this neuron initially does absolutely nothing. He goes back and forth a couple of times. He goes into the familiar place. Here's the second time the animal comes through. You get one spike, but it doesn't amount to much. Here's the third time, and here's the fourth time, and there it is. And this is what's called a place field. This is an area in space where that neuron fires. And one moment, the neuron was silent. And now every single time the animal passes through this place, that neuron reliably discharges a series of spikes, basically saying, hey, here I am. This is where I am. So if we imagine the components of what it takes to make an event memory or a memory of our experiences, this is sort of an appealing an analogy. Right? This idea that we suddenly create in our heads new patterns of activity, new patterns of connectivity that allow individual neurons to represent the elements of our daily experience. 
One thing I didn't mention is that this neuron started out sort of symmetric, and eventually it becomes asymmetric. It fires more in one direction than another. These neurons have that property where initially they represent a place in both directions, and then they come to be responsive not just to the place, but to the sequence of places. So they care. Did I get to this place from the left or the right? So this neuron likes it more when the animal went right to left. So we think that this is part, an essential part of the encoding process in our brain, whereby new patterns of activity are emerging all the time that represent sort of the individual elements of our experience. All right. So with that as one element, we can ask, well, OK, but our experiences are not made up of individual elements. What they're really made up of are sequences. Again, those of you who are here, have been here all day, you can sort of think about the transition from talks about malaria to cell signaling to cancer and so on. How do we build up memories for these experiences? How do we retrieve those memories? And one thing I just want to point out to you is we can retrieve our experiences in much less time than it took to store them, which is really useful, right? If you had to recapitulate your entire day for me to get, to get up to this point when I ask you, what did you do today? None of us would be particularly evolutionarily viable. So what we'd like to understand is what sort of processes can support this kind of rapid storage and retrieval of memories. So let's imagine our prototypical rat running through a place. And we might have three place fields of a cell. And as the animal runs through, these three neurons would be activated in a sequential order. All right. This is something that might take place on a time scale of seconds. And now let's imagine that we have an animal running in this W-shaped maze. And suppose the animal starts here, and he runs along this path. What we're going to do is we're going to take a series of neurons that we can record, and we're just going to number them based on the order in which the animal encountered them, with the ones closest to this end arm labeled first, and the others here. We're just doing it here based on distance from this endpoint. So this would be neuron 1, neuron 2, and so on. All right, so what would a signature be of memory retrieval, of the sort of processes that we'd like to see? Well, we might like to see this pattern of sequential activity re-expressed. And in fact, that's exactly the sort of thing that these animals are doing that the brain seems to be doing all the time. So in this case, the animal has been running on this track previously. And then he goes and sits in this rest box. All right? And in this rest box, the individual neurons, while the animal's running around, respond to the rest box. There are place cells that say, oh, here I am in this rest box. But when the animal stops, and this is an indication the animal walks around for the, in the five seconds before he comes to this location, so he walks around, he pauses for a moment, he ponders, he contemplates. During that period, this is what we see. We see this burst of activity that lasts about 150 milliseconds, where we have cells from this environment firing in this beautiful sequence. All right? These cells don't make any sense in this environment. These cells have nothing to do with that environment. What these cells are, is a representation of that experience. All right? And it turns out that this is going on all the time in these animals. So pretty much any time that they stop and pause, you can get replay from what they were doing half an hour, 45 minutes ago, and so on. It's as though as every time the brain is given a chance, the hippocampus says, hey, rest of the brain, I just learned something. Pay attention to this. And we think this is probably really important for the mechanisms that allow us to take individual experiences, things that we only experience once, and actually learn them. Because this is an intrinsic repetition mechanism that provides, we think, the kind of repeated exposure that the rest of the brain needs to learn. So that's the main content of what I wanted to say. I'll just sort of finish with, you know, we do think then that we can start maybe getting the, the tiniest bit of a handle on the processes that might allow us, for example, to construct our individual internal moral codes. If we can take the experiences that we had and the ones after which we did and got whacked with a stick, and the ones that we did and you know, got a nice reward, and we can store those, we can learn those relationships, that's what it seems like we need to do. And I'll just then say that these events, in fact, propagate out to the rest of the brain, to areas like the nucleus accumbens, which Pat showed in the, you know, in the voles, where you got sort of oxytocin responses. These events appear there as bursts of activity that seem to relate to the rewarding value of an experience. These events appear in places like the prefrontal cortex, where we make our decisions. So we think we're starting to get, as I said, the very beginning of a handle on how the brain might do these, from my perspective, really interesting things. Thank you. James? Um, one of the most fascinating uh, disorders in behavioral neurology is Wernicke's aphasia, an, ab an abnormality of semantic linguistics. And these patients are disordered way beyond simply communication, suggesting language much, may play, probably does play, a much richer role than simply communication. 
So the question I'd ask the panel is, what role do you think language plays in our encoding of the external world? Well, let, let me start by saying it can't play a huge role in the understanding of the external world of non-linguistic animals, right? And, and, and yet, what we do know, of course, is that they can be really quite adept in spatial knowledge and um, in social knowledge. So, so it must be the case that what you want fundamentally is a story of representations that doesn't depend on language. And then the question is, when you do this additional funny verbal rackety thing that we do, what exactly does that do for you? And I don't think that anybody has a very clear idea about that yet. Um, and, and, and that includes linguists, but especially in a way linguists, because many linguists have the view that you can think if and only if you have language. And that's clearly not true, otherwise infants couldn't learn language. Um. Yeah, I might briefly add something to that since I was <clears throat> promulgating the songbird as a model for various aspects of human language. I think one of the places where that falls down is precisely with respect to the issue of meaning and the, and the complex communication of ideas that we use language for in its full-blown form. So, where we see similarities is with respect to the process of learning to produce the sounds of language. And that includes, I think, some important precursors for the, the use of symbols for communication, which is to say it's well understood for human speech that the process of exposure to a particular language results in shaping of our perceptual abilities, which ultimately drives our learning. A, a good example of that is uh, Japanese uh, native language speakers have a notoriously hard time distinguishing between the ra and la, la sounds because in Japanese that's not a meaningful uh, distinction with respect to communication. So at, the, at that level of perceptual shaping, we see, we see a very analogous thing happening in the songbirds that creates different categories of sounds which are perceived in a fashion that's not directly related to the physical distances between those sounds. And so there's a process there that, that we think uh, can be studied in simpler models that creates uh, tokens or symbols, in, in a sense, cate categorical percepts that might be the substrates for more complex communication. But the, the, the songbirds, at least as far as we're aware, do not use uh, symbolic manipulation to communicate very flexibly with their vocalizations in the same fashion we do. And there, I think I agree with what Pat was saying, is that there's nothing intrinsic about using speech or language for that, but rather there's a facility of taking symbols and manipulating them in a, in a fashion which is uh, uh, socially shared to communicate complex ideas. And so for, for, the, for, the, for the glorious songbird, uh, I think we fall down at the level at that, at that area between understanding how uh, uh, some of the precursors for language develop and understanding symbolic manipulation. And for that latter, I think of uh, non-human primates potentially as being a more appropriate uh, system for trying to understand really what it is to communicate with uh, symbolically. So back on the rat for uh, just a second. Um, the flash of sort of memory when it rests how similar or different is that in a wakeful rest from when the rat eventually falls asleep? Yeah, this, this was actually one of the surprises of that study is all, many people have this model, our whole field has this model that what we do is we learn when we're awake and then the hippocampus stores all this information and then the animal goes to sleep. And that's a great time for the hippocampus to say, hey, rest of the brain, here's what I learned because you don't have sense ongoing sensory input. What we found, much to our shock, is that the events that occur when the animal has just been in motion are, in fact, significantly higher quality. That is, they're a significantly more accurate replay of what the animal just did than the events that occur in more sleep-like states. Um, so that, again, that really surprised us. It's kind of suggesting that perhaps our models of what sleep is doing, at least as far as these sort of event memories, may not be quite right. Um, and if you'll allow me to speculate wildly, so please don't take this too seriously, um, you know, there's this story about Kekulé and his understanding of the benzene molecule where he slept and saw, anyway, I won't go into the details, but the upshot is it may be that sleep is really good for things like insightful learning because it relaxes the constraints on which concepts can go together. And that in waking things, the network is more clamped down on, so you're more getting an accurate picture of what you've seen, but less sort of of this random creative neural activity that might be really useful for more insightful learning. And when you say sort of inaccuracies in the, in the sleep recall, it's sort of implying the rat's actually dreaming a bit off his real experience. Yeah, I mean, I, I hesitate the word dreaming because it's not usually during REM sleep and things like that, but it, yes, it looks less like the real experience. More neurons that shouldn't be active are active, and more neurons that should be active aren't quite there. 
Harold, then Mark. Uh, <laughs> Bruce said we should finish at 5. Are you going to kick us off? 5.15. You, you guys don't, they were only signed. Yeah. I, they weren't assigned the same hour and a half everybody else was. Yeah. So I'm sorry to focus so much on this experiment. This is really <laughs> fabulous. Um, two questions about the, the phenomenon. First, can you give us some sense of the scale? How many neurons are in these nucleus and, and how many are actually recording and sending right. messages? And secondly, you know, I know we can't find out exactly what the rat is thinking about that experience when things are firing, but suppose you, the rat goes through the same experience blindfolded or with some kind of earplugs on. Does that matter? All right. Um, so the first question is how many neurons? So in the rat, for example, this part of the brain area, CA1, has about 100,000 neurons on each side. Um, there's all sorts of interesting anatomical topography. Different parts do different things. But of the, say, 100 or so neurons that we can record at the same time, there'll be a subset that are active. Um, in that environment, say the 40% that we talked about. Um, those will represent different trajectories through the environment. And I guess the best way to answer that question is, of the neurons that are active on a given trajectory, for the really beautiful events, pretty much all of the neurons that we can record that are active on that trajectory are firing together, which suggests that it's a very broad population event that's pretty much engaging all of the neural resources associated to that representation. Um, and the second question in terms of what happens if you start taking away sensory inputs, uh, this is something that the hippocampal community has investigated in depth and shockingly unprofitably. What happens in the hippocampus is that it fills in extraordinarily well. So you take an animal, you turn out the lights, and it's mostly fine. Most of the cells that were active stay active. A few turn on, a few turn off. Um, you can confuse them if you try hard, but otherwise the system is extremely robust and uses whatever it can to construct a consistent map. Oh. Uh, Jonathan, so I have a, I guess. a question for Patricia. You mentioned that uh, man has been around for 300,000 years, and, but that culture, as far as we can tell, has been around for 45,000 years or so. Now, do you think that this really represents uh, that man was intact sort of organically and genetically 300,000 years ago, or that there have been genetic differences that occurred that were lost in the fossil, that you can't see in the fossil record? So has it really been that for six, uh, five, six of our existence, we've been here, but because of the culture wasn't there, we couldn't express our humanity? So far <laughs> as we know that we have been around, modern humans like you and me have been around for 300,000 years. Now, of course, there ha it's not that, that genetic evolution ground to a halt. And so there are, of course, some differences. Um, lactase persistence is, is one of them. And so there are some uh, groups who have lactase persistence beyond we the weaning stage. And that seems to have happened largely after about 10,000 years ago when herding of, of goats and cows became quite common. But the, the, if, if you look at the cranial size and the bone structure and, um, and so far as we know, roughly speaking, the genetics, we're pretty much the same guys. And um, I mean, of course, within this room, there are obviously lots of, of genetic differences. But the hypothesis that about 45,000 years ago, there was this big genetic event that happened in Europe and suddenly we got language and we got smart and we got really interested in cave painting. It really seems unlikely at, at this <laughs> stage. Um, but, but of course, you know, uh, the, the anthropologists are, are, are still making new finds. I mean, the finding that 75,000 years ago in the Blombus Cave in South Africa, there are bone tools, uh, including awls and knives and so on. That was only made within the last five or six years. And hitherto, people thought that culture really began in Europe 45,000 years ago. So, um, so there's a lot that's still being discovered and a lot, a lot that's changing. But I mean, with regard to something like fire, it's quite clear that, it, that hominins before humans, not just Neanderthals, but uh, uh, um, Homo erectus used fire. So um, it's a big puzzle why what, what humans were doing running around in Africa for such a long time 
And I mean, and if Chomsky is really right that they all started off with the language gene, you have to ask yourself, so like, what were they talking about all that? Time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's still innovation there, right? That's the problem. Yeah. yeah. Although Jonathan, like your yeast, who go into this long latent period before they assemble their their prions, I think it's it's entirely possible that culture is autocatalytic in the same way, and yeah. that the capacity was there. Sure. It wasn't. It never came into effect, and then once it came into effect, it really flourished. I, I want to go in the other yeah. direction. Yeah. In Mark. a sense, uh, I mean, the examples uh, you gave about the. Uh, sort of uh, reinforcement of cultural values and then, or even just learning, were all from, uh, started from uh, primates and then to mammals. And yet neurons and complex uh, uh, nervous systems uh, predated vertebrates, certainly. And, uh, and so what, <coughs> what's common and what, uh, what is this, is, uh, you know, what do we know about these learning experiences in, uh, in lower organisms, so-called or simpler organisms, even invertebrate organisms. And uh, why is that not a place to really pull out some of the uh, fundamental features that one wants to study, since that has been sort of the um, strategy in many ways of uh, biology and other fields? Without a doubt, you want to do that. Um, you, you do want to understand the, those sorts of learning mechanisms in, in invertebrates. And of course, there is, there is lovely work, for example, on decision making in the leech. Um, and uh, and, and, and it, it's actually work that I, I think really does, you can sort of see as an, as an anticipation of later kinds of decisions in complex nervous systems. Um, so, so, yeah, I think without a doubt it's really important. It's just that the particular kind of sociality that you see in mammals and birds is quite different, so far as we can tell, from what you see, say, in garter snakes. Uh, I mean, at least they're in, in garter snakes, the, the, the young are born live, and they're all kind of in their, in their little uh, hole in the ground together, and then they all, you know, take off. And there is also some evidence, but we don't know how recent this is, um, evolutionarily speaking, that alligators uh, are quite um, apt to tend to their young and will respond to distress calls. But, I mean, that... That could have developed within the last hundred million years, and we think, you know, that birds and humans separated something like uh, 250 million years ago. So, so social insects, for example, have. A I think it's a different deal. That's, you yeah. know, that's uh, kind of what we always thought about everything, and then when you go back to <laughs> when you go back yeah. to these uh, to simpler organisms, they seem to. I mean, for example, it was widely thought that the brain or the head was uh, something really de novo in vertebrates. And you know, none of the patterning mechanisms, uh, that, you know, that was, that, there was a lot of arguments about that. But, and then really the discovery of the basic patterning mechanisms of the brain in, uh, in invertebrates turned out to be very, very, very similar. Mm. So I, <clears throat> I just w wonder, you know, I, uh, and, that, and that, anyways, you've talked about, about uh, social things, but certainly the kind of learning that Lauren talked about and, Michael talked about were are, are things that are not particularly social, and uh, right. those I can imagine would exist there. So I, that's, that's yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll comment Mark, briefly on that. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, I I would say that I mean it is very attractive to work on on um, simpler organisms, but uh, you know Corey Bargman's work say on olfactory system in C. elegans, which is an absolutely you know, wonderful story, a lovely story, shows that it is fundamentally different from the way our auditory, our, our olfactory system works in that the different olfactory receptors are connected to the, they are connected to cells that do approach or cells that do avoidance. We can learn to approach or avoid 
odors at will because our olfactory receptors are not connected directly to the cells that affect behavior but are connected to some intermediate representation. And that's why we can take our children to Indian restaurants and after a while they love the food, <laughs> which is not a capacity of C. elegans, although Corey can switch receptors in these cells and make them love Indian food. But so, so I think that, you know, while bacilli may be subtle, there's differences and in some cases fundamental differences in principle between the organization of the way the nervous system encodes sensation and behavior in some species from other species. And, you know, it's, it's been a wonderful thing for neuroscience that, you know, all of the genetic tricks that we can use in the rest of biology we can use in mice to study the brain. So I, I think for, for many problems, the, the, the vertebrate is not so inaccessible as we would have imagined it was 10 years ago. I guess because I'm more interested in frogs, I'm wondering whether humans are a good model system for understanding, <laughs> understanding yeah. the frog. Yeah. So, I had a, a question that was stimulated by Lauren, but might be more appropriate for Patricia. Um, so when the, the mice recapitulate and they go back through this experiential thing, do they, do they get rewarded if it was a, a good experience and not rewarded if it was uh, something that would be punitive? And, and then how do you integrate this sort of learning process and memory process with then the development of the moral responsiveness? Um, uh, I can I can think of lots of pleasurable memories, and sometimes I think I get more pleasure out of it than I did at the time. Uh. <laughs> well, when, when we talk about the reward system, I mean, <laughs> I know what you mean. Uh, <laughs> when we talk about the reward system, of course, we mean learning via positive and negative reward. So, so certainly punishing events are, are, are well remembered in, in the casual sense. Now, I don't know whether you guys have looked at punishing events in the, in the hippocampus No, or not. we have looked at reward, yeah. and reward causes, depending on how you measure it, a four to eight-fold increase in how likely you are to get these recapitulation events occurring after the experience. So it's a huge effect on the system. Novelty causes sort of a, a similar, although slightly lower magnitude increase. So that's kind of the flip side of what you were saying there. That's the outward world modulating how likely it is these memories are to be turned on. Um, the only other thing I can add is because these patterns of activity at least have the potential to propagate out to other brain regions and other people have shown that during sleep you get cells that were activated say by a rewarding experience in the nucleus accumbens that are also turned on following these hippocampal replay events. It's not clear whether that constitutes a subjective experience of reward, but it sure looks like it's activating the same circuits. And that if the animal potentially were paying attention to that and allowing that activity to sort of turn into a full-blown internal experience, it could be the sort of, you know, enjoying it as much or more than the initial experience. So we never, so how does that modify behavior then? All you got to do is think about it. Right, well, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's, there's a fairly long history of people doing mental rehearsal to improve their performance. Now, most of that is on motor tasks, um, where actually things like sleep improve in performance on motor tasks. Memories always get worse with time. It's just a question of how quickly. But we absolutely know that rehearsal helps, right? And so that if you, want, if you had one rewarding experience, it's possible that focusing on that and ret retrieving it multiple times would cement it in much, much more strongly um, than, in, than it might be cemented in other circumstances. Yeah, and qu quite a few years ago, we showed that the amount of the sort of slow form of cortical plasticity you get is is exactly proportional, and you know, 95 percent of the variance can be accounted for by how much slow wave sleep you get after the experience that induces that plasticity. So sleep clearly does play a role in the slow form of plasticity. Should we? One more? Should we? Uh, one more? <laughs> one more. Um, I have a question about the, uh, use, the scientific use of the term morals. Um, you know, I recall with Plato in the old days, 
uh, mentioned that uh, morality, in a way, is uh, the choice of the lesser evil. And uh, so my question is, do you include in your definition of morality, immorality? And are they both together? And if not, how do you distinguish them? It's a good question. Um, but the way I think about it, first of all, is that the social and the moral are all on a continuum. And that is moral as in, is a moral issue with an answer that people will think is largely right or largely wrong. And so, so an example of the merely social might be whether to wear a hat to a funeral or whether to lick your knife at dinner. Whereas an example of the moral might be whether to have a military draft uh, or whether to put a tax on banks uh, and so on, uh, to take two contemporary issues. Uh, and, and, but I think there is a range of things that go in between. So something can be a moral issue if it's serious in this sense where it's going to have consequences to someone's well-being or to their, to their interests. But the same decision in one situation of course. can be considered moral. Of course. Whereas immoral in another situation. Well, it depends. I mean, there's, there's two parts to that. Um, first of all, of course, practices can vary between cultures. So in some cultures, it might be extremely rude to lick your knife at table, and in others, perfectly acceptable. And similarly, with regard to some things such as infanticide. So uh, there, there are certainly have been and still exist some cultures in which infanticide is perfectly normal and perfectly acceptable, somewhat regrettable perhaps, but if it's done you know, immediately after birth, it's what's done. Um, so there's going to be, there is certainly going to be variability. So that's one kind of variability. Another kind of variability is going to be making a particular movement in one context, maybe a merely uh, social faux pas, making that same movement in another context might be deeply immoral. So um, it, it, you know, it would depend on, I mean, it would be fairly easy to construct such an example, but, you know, pressing a button and, and calling the butler might be a social faux pas, but pressing the button and setting off a, a, a missile attack on, on Saudi Arabia might be a little more than a faux pas. <laughs> uh, so, so the, of course, there can be variability, but that's, and I didn't have time to talk about this, of course, in the talk, but that's why the story about tying morality to rules is deeply mistaken. Um, and we talked about John Rawls, for example, at, at, at lunch, but there are other, other um, approaches that say that the fundamentals of morality have to do with rules, and that's clearly wrong. I mean, I have to go into a big song and dance to give you the detail on, on that, um, but, um, but it, it actually won't work. So, yeah, so thank you, Mike, for incorporating this huge spectrum.